having spent many years overseas on army service in India, I had risen to the rank of captain, before a deep and abiding desire akin to homesickness at its most virulent prompted me to resign my commission and sail for home and England's green and pleasant lands once more. I was dearly looking forward to reconnecting with old friends and family members, and from amongst my old friendships there was no one I was more desirous to rekindle than that of Lord Archibald Cox, known to his intimates as Baldy. We had been undergraduates at Oxbridge, specifically at Gaylord College, where we had roomed together. We had maintained an affectionate, though sporadic, correspondence in the intervening years, and it was with immense pleasure, shortly after my arrival in Southampton, that I received a letter from Baldy, saying he had heard on the grapevine that I had arrived back in Old Blighty and now urged me to come down at speed to Coxcombe, his place in Hampshire. In fact, he more than urged, he insisted. Telegram to say when you arrive, he wrote, and I will arrange to send the dog cart to meet you at the station. Having consulted the railway timetable, I did as I was bid, and the very next morning, having checked out of the star, found myself trundling along the branch line to Coxcombe. As promised, I found the horse-drawn cart awaiting me, even as I stepped down from the train and was driven at pace to Coxcombe Manor by a young, handsome, curly-haired groom by the name of Bertie Trussell, whose large, rough, muscular hands held the reins as he kept me entertained with bawdy songs and local history along the way. The glory that was Baldy's ancestral home, with ornamental garden, lay within its own parkland where deer and pheasant roamed freely. At the end of a long and impressive drive we finally drew up before the principal entrance, and there I saw my old friend standing in the portico, excitedly awaiting my arrival. The face that I had not seen for so many years was much changed, yet still unmistakable, despite the addition of his impressive dark brown beard and moustaches, and the subtraction of hair upon his head, leaving a bald, bullish pate, and I was delighted to see by his joyous smile that he had managed to keep all his own teeth. He was just as darkly handsome, nay, more handsome, in his middle years than when younger, and my heart rejoiced. Maxwell, he cried. Baldy indeed, I replied. We laughed and fell into each other's manly embrace. When we finally broke apart, he took both my hands in his and led me inside and into the library, where once he had locked the door, we tore off all our clothes and launched into a frenetic bout of naked wrestling. It was as if all the years had melted away, our exertions being just as energetic as in our student days. This had been our tradition. It was how we excised our surfeit of energy after a dull day of lectures, and it felt good to revisit our past and recapture our youthful virility. Finally, having allowed him to beat me into submission, he pinned me down on the carpet, sweat dripping from his brow, and kissed me full on the mouth, as in our teens. To the winner, the spoils, he laughed. Welcome home, Max. Welcome home, old friend. And with that he sprang to his feet, and horseplay over, stepped into his breeches. He had ordered my luggage up to my room, which was ready prepared, and bade me bathe and dress for dinner. His wife and children were, he told me, due back from visiting their neighbour, Lady Chatterley Mellors, shortly, so to get a move on, as she was awfully keen to meet me and it would not do for me to be smelling like a bear. The butler led me through the grand hall and up the spiral staircase and showed me to my room, complete with ensuite bathroom. 
The room, I observed, was hung with lurid old masters, picturing mythical characters of the undraped variety, cavorting together as mythical characters are wont to do, and all overlooking a sumptuous four-poster bed, bedecked with red velvet curtains that matched those hung at the window. In truth, the deco struck me as more suited to a house of ill repute than a country seat. Not that I was overly familiar with the interior of the former, you understand. A place had been set for me at dinner next to Lord Archibald's beloved wife, Lady Letitia. She struck me at the first as charming, as she was lovely, and proved to be just as tactile as dear Archie, in her habit of placing her hand on my inner thigh between courses. Besides my host, there were their fourteen children in attendance. Ada, Barnabas, Camilla, Dulcie, Elliot, Francis, Gerald, Helena, Ira, Jacob, Kendrick, Leopold, Martha, and Nora, plus the elderly vicar, the Reverend Javier Yale, and his good and dutiful wife Zena, who had been staying for a few days and attending to the children's moral welfare. After dinner, the children entertained us with a jolly song and dance routine as they exited up to bed, and, with the plaintive little solo voice of Nora, the youngest, still ringing in our ears, for she sang very well indeed, we passed into the drawing room to partake of a compendium of board games. Snakes and ladders, Ludo, Tiddlywinks, I admit, I had never come across such an insatiable and wildly competitive bunch. Mrs. Yale, especially, played with all the grim determination of a woman possessed, in stark contrast to her otherwise submissive demeanour. I think it must have been past midnight when I retired, leaving them to it. Once, in the welcome quietude of my room, I drew back the curtains on the rod to let in the moonlight, undressed and... Lacking the energy even to slip on my nightshirt or beneath the sheets, I climbed fully naked onto the coverlet and promptly fell asleep. I slept so soundly, in fact, that even the window cleaner failed to have fully arouse me the next morning, though he certainly seemed to take his time performing his task. In my half-dozing state, the sound of a chamois squeaking against glass was strangely comforting, and it was past eleven when I finally rose to face the day, by which time any trace of him had gone. In the event, I was the first to arise, the other adults, I was soon to learn, having continued to play games until half-past four, was still recovering. I ate rolls and drank coffee in the morning room before needy of company. I left word with the housekeeper that I was setting out for a stroll and made my way to the stables in the hope of engaging young Bertie in further pleasant discourse. Bertie, however, was in a heated debate with a brawny mustachioed gentleman who I assumed to be the window cleaner. Based upon the ladder he held under his muscular arm and, unwilling to intrude, I turned on my heels and left them to it, returning in the direction I had come. I set off for a brisk walk around the grounds. I returned to the house, having worked up quite the appetite, just in time to enjoy a late lunch with my hosts, the Reverend and his wife having taken the children off on a picnic to a local stone circle, dating back into antiquity. Half four in the morning, I reprimanded them both in good humour, then sipped from the spoonful of broth I held to my lips. I trust it was worth staying up for. Letitia's laugh fairly shimmered as she broke a bread roll and spread butter upon one half of it. It's a shell, it's quite the competitor, but Archie trumped her in the end. Only just, dear, only just. I fear the Reverend was quite embarrassed by his lady wife's competitive streak. He turned to me conspiratorially. And even when we retired, I still wasn't allowed to sleep, as Letitia kept prattling on to me about your welfare. My welfare? Archibald, she admonished him, though fondly. Yes, welfare, Baldy replied. 
She is much of the opinion that a strapping fellow with private income such as yourself would benefit greatly from the attentions of a kind and loving wife in retirement, and would perhaps further benefit from the blessings of children of his own. I do believe she would be more than happy to play the role of matchmaker. He winked at her. I do have a number of likely candidates in mind, she offered. I'll take it under advisement, I replied, touched by her concern but disinclined to commit. Thankfully, Baldy changed the subject. And you? You slept well, I hope. The bed was comfortable. Supremely comfortable, I replied. I slept like a log. Even the window cleaner couldn't disturb me. Letitia paused mid mastication. Arched an eyebrow and swallowed. The window cleaner? she asked curiously. But he's working on the north side of the house. He's not due to work his way around to the south face until the middle of next week. Sorry if you were inconvenienced at all. She looked at Archie. He frowned. I'll have a word with the housekeeper. Sorry about that, old chap. Please don't trouble yourself, I smiled. And the soup is delicious, by the way. My compliments to the cook. After lunch, Letitia retired to attend to her correspondence, and Baldy took the opportunity to introduce me to the sport of clay pigeon shooting. Bertie was recruited as clay pigeon handler, releasing the birds at intervals into the clear blue sky. His formerly cheerful features seemed somewhat clouded over in contrast, and he kept a respectful distance whilst concentrating rather grimly on his task. The fast-moving, unpredictable targets proved a tough challenge, even for a practice marksman such as Archie but he took immense pleasure in the pastime, which clearly appealed to his competitive nature, though I blushed to disclose that I did not provide him with much competition. Once the clay targets were released, we took aim and fired upon them. Punch were awarded for a number of kill shots. My score was dismal, but Archie was generous in assuring me that I had become quite accomplished given practice. The shotgun had quite a kick, and despite Baldy's hands-on demonstration of best practice, my shoulder ached from the constant kickback, and much as I had enjoyed having his company exclusively to myself, I was not displeased when we completed the standard round, and with daylight fast fading, we returned to the house. The great hall was ringing with the animated chatterings of the children as we entered. The reverend and his lady wife stood to one side, fatigued and deeply grateful to be handing over their charges to the care of the nursery maid, who marched the children away with no-nonsense military expertise, whilst the weary pair climbed the stairs for a welcome nap before supper. Archie and I parted ways, and a short time later I luxuriated in the bathtub and soaked my aching shoulder. Certainly. I could not wish for more comfortable lodging, I thought to myself. A hot bath, a comfortable bed, fine food and the best of company. Though I was somewhat perturbed by the incident with the window cleaner and Bertie's changed manner, I set these things aside and let myself enjoy a pleasant doze in the welcome warmth of the soapy suds. There was a fire in the large grate in my room and I dried myself in front of it before dressing for dinner. The children were not to dine with us tonight, and so it was a small party of five that gathered at the dinner table. It was to be the last night of the Reverend's stay. With Christmas fast approaching, he and his wife were beholden to his parishioners to engage in preparations for his many related obligations. He reminded us, if any reminder was necessary, that Christmas was the busiest time in the Christian calendar but cordially invited us all, myself included, to visit the parsonage in the new year. When Archie and the Reverend retired to the smoking room and the ladies to the parlour, instead of joining them, I went out into the ornamental garden for a breath of fresh air. A sanguineous moon hung in the night sky, and all was quiet, save for the hooting of an owl at some distance. 
I lit a cigarette and walked along the side of the house, and it was only upon turning the corner that, with some surprise, I came upon Bertie, who was furiously engaged in cleaning the shotguns. His mouth was fixed and sullen. Are you quite all right, Bertie? I inquired. I don't know what you mean, sir, he replied. You don't seem your usual jolly self. The observation was met with silence. I went on. Forgive me, but, um, I stumbled upon your argument with the window cleaner this morning. Window cleaner, sir? But he's off with the sniffles at the moment, sir. With the sniffles? I replied curiously. But the man with the ladder? Oh, him. Filch. He's one of the odd job men. He's been clearing out a rook's nest. At the front of the house. No, at the side, sir. And you were having words. He owes me money, sir. I need the money back, sir. For a ring. I was hoping to surprise my fiancé with a wedding band upon Christmas Day, but he says he can't pay until New Year. His lip trembled. I reached inside my dress coat and, taking out my wallet, held a crisp white five-pound note towards him. Will that cover it? Yes, but I couldn't, sir. Indeed you can. There is to be no argument. It is little to me, but much to you and your good lady. He took it from me then. Then, grasping my proffered hand, he kissed it. God bless you, sir. Our first boy will be named in your honour. A generous return on my investment. If there is anything, anything I can ever do for you, sir. There is, Bertie. Name it, sir. Just information. You say the window cleaner is off with the sniffles and filch was working at the side of the house. And yet I could have sworn that there was a window cleaner at my window this morning. Bertie regarded me queerly, and after a brief hesitation said, That'll have been the ghost, sir. The ghost? Yes. The ghost of Lug. Lug? Yes, sir. A man called Lug was formerly engaged in that capacity, I understand. Rumour has it, he saw something he shouldn't have, whilst performing his duties, and was so shocked he tumbled to his death, split his skull open on one of those ornamental urns that lined the frontage. And when was this? Some years ago. But there are staff who have it that they've seen him since that dread day and with his ghostly ladder placed up against the south face at the very spot where he fell. When I returned to the house, it appeared the others had retired for the night, and so I made my way upstairs. Seated beside the fire in my room, I tried to distract myself with a book, but finding it uninteresting, I soon gave up and went to bed, but not before checking that the window was securely locked and the curtains tightly closed. I drew the bed curtains around me and huddled down for the night. Having been denied the opportunity to quiz my host as to why they had failed to mention the ghost's existence, I resolved to do so at the earliest opportunity, before falling into a restless sleep. I know not how long I slept, but I was suddenly awoken with the impression of having heard the latch click on the window sash at the further extremity of my boudoir. I was at once completely and acutely conscious with all my faculties in a heightened state of awareness. The wind had arisen, and was blowing a gale around the house. Moments passed without issue, and I had almost convinced myself that what I had previously heard had been mere imagination, when I distinctly heard the sash window sliding open, and then the wind entered the room causing the bed curtains to ripple. I sat up to listen, and as I did so, I distinctly heard steps approaching the bed from beyond my curtained enclosure. 
I could see nothing, of course. My view obscured and all was dark within. But I was now certain I heard a stealthy tread proceeding inexorably towards me. Then the tread seemed to pause. Upon the instant my eyes were nearly blinded by a sudden burst of light in the darkness and it appeared to me that a prominent bulge had appeared in the curtain immediately at my shoulder. A bulge that quickly morphed into a face, or rather, a velvet mask, with forehead, nose, lips and chin clearly outlined. The scarlet mouth opened wide, and a hideous scream rang out. It was my own. "'What do you want with me, spirit?' I cried in mortal terror. "'Much,' replied the ghost. It was at that point, I believe, that I fainted. I cannot comment on what occurred in the hours that followed, other than to state that when I woke in the morning, I was to find all curtains thrown aside along with my nightshirt, and that I was experiencing the most sublime sense of relaxation I had felt in years. A relaxation that extended from the top of my head throughout my entire body to the very tips of my toes. I, of course, quizzed my host at the breakfast table first thing. Why did you not tell me about the ghost? Ghost? Baldy appeared bemused. Yes, ghost, the ghost of Lug, the former window cleaner who fell to his death from the window to my room. Lurk, <laughs> Letitia tittered. What an unfortunate name. Not as unfortunate as falling to one's death, Archie observed with a chuckle. Well, if he did, old man, it was before my time or my father's. Who told you of this nonsense? Why, Bertie. Bertie did. Ah, Bertie. Archie exchanged a knowing glance with his wife. He is indeed our local historian and a gifted storyteller to boot, but I would pay it no mind if I were you. No mind, I repeated and there the matter was dropped. I returned often to Coxcomb thereafter, indeed, became a second home. In due course I was made godfather to baby Maxwell, and was blessed to see him flourish over the years alongside Baldy and Letitia's own happy brood, and always returning to my room, for it became known as my room, where I was to sleep forever after like the dead. Mm -hmm.